Wall Street is selling out to China, and it's much worse than you think. But what are they getting in return? Welcome back to John Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Over the last couple of years, the U.S. government has been getting tougher and tougher on China. But don't worry, because China has one powerful friend left in the U.S. Wall Street. Yes, Wall Street CEOs really want to be BFFs with the Chinese Communist Party. The kind of best friends who make lots of money together selling out America. And Wall Street is not afraid to let people know. Take Larry Fink the CEO of BlackRock. BlackRock is the world's largest asset management company. It has more than $7 trillion of assets under management. It's invested in things like mutual funds, retirement funds, and exchange-traded funds. Back in 2018, BlackRock received an award from the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, a nonprofit that promotes understanding and cooperation between the U.S. and China. The award was presented at a black tie gala dinner featuring speeches by former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and Chinese Ambassador Tsui Tian Kai, who read a congratulatory message from Chinese leader Xi Jinping. That dinner, by the way, raised more than $2 million for that nonprofit. Is it too late for me to sell out? Meanwhile, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink took the opportunity to praise China's leadership. And the work China has done to lift millions out of poverty and build strong middle class is one of the great economic achievements of our lifetime. And I would, oh, when I am in China, I always congratulate the leaders for what a, an accomplishment. Yes, first, China's communist leaders destroyed their country's economy for 30 years. Then, they actually let people make their own money again. And finally, they took all the credit. What an accomplishment. But Larry Fink didn't just parrot Chinese Communist Party propaganda. He went on to talk about how China still has a long way to go, but don't worry, because foreign companies can help Chinese people build their investments. Foreign companies like BlackRock, I assume. BlackRock is not alone. The biggest Wall Street investment banks, private equity firms, and hedge funds are all complicit. What these companies and their CEOs have done is shocking. And I'm going to name names later in this episode. But first, how does Wall Street influence the U.S. government on China? I'll show you after the break. Welcome back. How does Wall Street influence the U.S. government on China policy? White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro explains. Consider the shuttle diplomacy that's now going on by a self-appointed group of Wall Street bankers and hedge fund managers between the U.S. and China. As part of a Chinese government influence operation, these globalist billionaires are putting a full-court press on the White House in advance of the G20 in Argentina. The mission of these unregistered foreign agents, that's what they are, they're unregistered foreign agents, is to pressure this president into some kind of deal. Navarro is talking about Wall Street pressuring the Trump administration to cut a trade deal with China back in 2018. He uses some pretty strong language here, calling these Wall Street bankers globalist billionaires and unregistered foreign agents, and accusing them of being part of a Chinese government influence operation. Is that going too far? Well, consider this. China's chief trade negotiator, Liu He, came to the U.S. in February 2018 to try and work out a trade deal with the White House. According to the Wall Street Journal, before Liu even met with U.S. officials, he met with a group of Wall Street executives. Looking for allies in trade talks with the Trump administration, Mr. Liu dangled a prize. Beijing offered to give U.S. financial firms a new opportunity to expand in China. And it worked. The get-together helped turn Wall Street into one of the biggest cheerleaders for a trade deal. Unfortunately for Wall Street, 
the Trump administration wasn't buying what they were selling. Right after President Trump took office, we predicted on this show that he would put tariffs on China, based on the fact that he had been consistently talking about it for decades. A year later, he did. And that's when China's Wall Street allies started losing their clout. In September 2018, executives from some of the biggest Wall Street companies traveled to Beijing to meet with Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan, Xi Jinping's right-hand man. Those executives also met with current and former Chinese officials and bankers to find ways to strengthen financial ties between the United States and China. Yeah, if Gordon Gekko were around today, he'd be smoking his Cuban cigars in Shanghai. Selling out is good. But the Chinese Communist Party's courting of Wall Street didn't start because of the recent trade war. It's been going on for decades. Let's travel back to the year 1999, when the biggest thing we were worrying about was the Y2K computer bug. And the biggest thing we were looking forward to was a new Star Wars movie. Well, we're older and wiser now. The Matrix also came out that year. And you just didn't listen, Mr. Anderson. In April 1999, Chinese Premier Zhu Rongji visited the U.S. The purpose of his trip was to lobby U.S. officials and business executives to support China's entry into the World Trade Organization. He even gave the CEO of NASDAQ a carved wooden bull. Highly symbolic, because the Chinese Communist Party would spend the next 20 years giving Wall Street a truckload of bull. But Zhu Rongji also played hardball, warning business executives that they wouldn't get access to the China market unless a trade agreement was quickly approved. Taking his case to the American business interests that have consistently pushed for expanded commercial ties to the world's biggest market, Mr. Zhu insisted that compromises allowing American telecommunications firms, farm products, banks, and insurance companies into the Chinese market could all perish. Well, it worked. And the White House ended up giving in to pressure from the business community. The Clinton administration helped China join the World Trade Organization. And the rest is history. Really depressing history, involving the loss of millions of American jobs and the hollowing out of U.S. manufacturing. But hey, Wall Street made billions of dollars. The Chinese Communist Party has learned a lot about manipulating Wall Street over the last 20 years. And I'll show you a video later that proves it. Stick around because it's explosive. But first, it's time to name names, right after this short break. Welcome back. Who are the biggest Wall Street sellouts? Well, I can't go into detail about all of the Wall Street companies that have sold out to China or this video would be 20 hours long. But I'll give you some highlights. Let's start with BlackRock, the asset management company I talked about at the beginning of this episode. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink is gunning for the China market. In his 2019 letter to shareholders, Fink said, our goal is to become one of the country's leading global asset managers. But don't worry, this is good for the U.S., according to BlackRock. BlackRock told the Wall Street Journal that U.S. financial institutions expanding in China is consistent with the policy goals of the U.S. government. Yes, it's consistent with the U.S. government's policy goals that were set up by Wall Street in the 90s. BlackRock's China ambitions have also affected the larger investment market in a pretty disturbing way. MSCI is one of the biggest index providers in the world. Lots of big investors, like banks and government pension funds, invest according to MSCI's indexes. Back in 2017, MSCI was considering adding Chinese A shares, which are stocks that trade in mainland China, to its emerging markets indexes. The Chinese government lobbied heavily for the inclusion. The other strong voice that helped drive the shift was from BlackRock. Just that one change steered tens of billions of dollars into China's stock market. So, thanks to BlackRock, the money in your bank account or your pension fund could be invested in China. And you have 
absolutely no control over that. Yay! Now let's move from BlackRock to Blackstone. Blackstone is the world's largest private equity fund. That means it invests money for private groups of investors. Back in 2007, China's Sovereign Wealth Fund bought a stake in Blackstone. They sold their stake in 2018 as the trade war with China ramped up. Blackstone's CEO, Stephen Shoresman, has been called Trump's China Whisperer. Shoresman says he made eight trips to China in 2018 on behalf of the White House, trying to assure China's most senior officials that the president was not looking for a trade war. I bet that went well. Shoresman also helped organize trade talks between the U.S. and China behind the scenes. But that's not his only connection to China. Mr. Shoresman has raised more than $500 million to build a scholarship program in his name at China's prestigious Tsinghua University. But educating Chinese youth is a lot better than what one investment bank did. J.P. Morgan Chase is one of the few Wall Street companies that have actually gotten in trouble with the U.S. government over its China activities. It was forced to pay $264 million in fines for violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Between 2006 and 2013, the bank developed a referral program known as Sons and Daughters for applicants connected to business or government officials that could land J.P. Morgan work. As J.P. Morgan hired more and more candidates based on referrals from Chinese leaders, senior bankers in several instances explicitly tied those jobs or internships to securing deals with Chinese government-run companies. So basically, J.P. Morgan Chase hired the children of Communist Party officials in order to get business in China. And they got caught. And they had to pay $264 million in fines, which might sound like a lot to you and me, but it's less than a tenth of 1% of their market cap. So did they really care? And even what J.P. Morgan Chase did is small potatoes compared to investment bank Goldman Sachs, which once employed the grandson of former Chinese leader and money toad Jiang Zemin. The book Hidden Hand says, No organization has been more important to the CCP's campaign to penetrate U.S. elites or more willing than Goldman Sachs. This isn't surprising, since Goldman also has close links to the U.S. government, which the Chinese Communist Party wants to influence. Goldman Sachs is one of the most heavily invested financial firms in the U.S. federal government whether it manifests in the form of campaign donations, hiring former government officials as lobbyists, or having former employees receive appointments to powerful cabinet positions. Mmm, so many possible targets of influence, so little time. Speaking of Goldman employees that get cabinet positions, Hank Paulson was the CEO of Goldman Sachs until he became Treasury Secretary under George W. Bush. By the time he became Treasury Secretary in July 2006, Hank Paulson had traveled to China about 70 times in his capacity as a top Goldman Sachs executive. By that time, Goldman Sachs had already helped Chinese state-owned enterprises raise billions of dollars on the U.S. stock market. And in his first trip to China as Treasury Secretary, Paulson even got a private meeting with then-Chinese leader Hu Jintao. Paulson, by the way, is good buddies with Chinese Vice President Wang Qishang. They started working together in the 90s. Well, that's the happiest I've ever seen Wang Qishang. What happened to you, Wang? What horrors have you seen that you dare not name? Communism is bad for the soul. Anyway, back to Hank Paulson. After leaving office in 2009, he set up his own think tank, the Paulson Institute which is dedicated to fostering a U.S.-China relationship that serves to maintain global order in a rapidly evolving world. Yes, a relationship that serves to maintain global order sounds totally normal and not creepy or authoritarian at all. Moving on to another former Goldman Sachs executive, John Thornton. He was co-president when Hank Paulson was CEO. 
When Thornton left Goldman in 2003, he joined Tsinghua University as the director of their Global Leadership Program. In 2006, he gave $12.5 million to the Brookings Institution think tank to fund the John L. Thornton China Center. And in 2008, he received the Friendship Award, the highest honor given to foreign experts working in China. Thornton has also been involved in Trump's trade negotiations. Back in August 2018, he briefed China's trade negotiator Liu He in Beijing. And Thornton also helped arrange a meeting between Wang Qishan and Steve Bannon? I wonder what those two talked about. This episode just keeps getting weirder. I should also mention that in the Trump administration, current Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is also a former Goldman Sachs executive. However, he didn't really work on the China side of things at Goldman. Mnuchin's China conflicts come from his former role as a Hollywood producer? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. So Mnuchin's Hollywood ties raise ethical questions because he was pushing for Beijing to give Hollywood more access to the China market. But Hank Paulson's Goldman Sachs ties that directly involved putting American money in Chinese state-owned companies did not raise ethical questions? Really? New York Times? Don't get me wrong, when it comes to selling out to the Chinese Communist Party, Hollywood's hands are not clean. But if Hollywood's hands are dirty, Wall Street's hands are caked in three inches of mud. As I spent this whole episode showing, this problem is not new. It's been happening since at least the 1990s, but it's likely going to get worse because the Chinese Communist Party has figured out how to manipulate America's elite. And I'll show you how after this final commercial break. Welcome back. As I like to say, the Chinese Communist Party is great at manipulating America's elite. I'm going to show you part of a speech given last month by Di Dongsheng, an associate dean at Renmin University, a prestigious university in Beijing. Chen 就是因为咱们上边有人。啊,就是我们在美国的全市核心圈啊。He goes on to tell a story about how an old friend of China from a top U.S. financial institution helped him pressure a famous Washington, D.C. bookstore into doing an event for Xi Jinping's book back in 2015. I've cut that because it's too long, but the next clip is definitely worth watching. 我前面讲过，华尔街在一九七零年代开始对美国它的内政外交有非常强的影响力啊，所以我们有路径依赖，是吧？但问题是零八年之后，华尔街的地位下降了，更重要的是一六年之后，华尔街搞不定特朗普，
Because now that there's a phase one trade deal, the Chinese Communist Party is rewarding a lot of the companies I talked about earlier for being a good friend to China. Since the signing of the trade deal, JP Morgan will get full control of a futures venture in which it had a minority stake. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley became controlling owners of their Chinese securities ventures. And in August, BlackRock became the first foreign firm to win preliminary approval to start a wholly owned mutual fund business in China. See, selling out is good. Of course, ultimately, it's not going to be a happy ending for Wall Street, because the Chinese Communist Party is luring American companies to China for a specific reason. But that's a topic for another episode. Still, the Chinese Communist Party is keeping Wall Street happy for now, because no matter which political party is in power in America, Wall Street will always be there to grease the wheels for the communists, like a loyal friend should. And now, it's time for me to answer a question from a fan who supports China Uncensored on Patreon. We couldn't afford to keep making this show without their support. Zed asks, Thank you for the great content. Any plans to expand further with this momentum? Asia, Europe, Central slash South America Uncensored? Happy holidays and positive vibes. Now that's an interesting question, Zed. I was actually just talking with Matt about doing new shows. His suggestion was, that we do a show that's just him playing with Legos. He really likes Legos. And while that's a great idea, maybe there's some better kind of show we could do. Shelley had a great idea for a cooking show, where we invite all the world's top dictators on. It's called Cooking with Authority. Kim Jong-un still hasn't returned my call. But if we were to start another show, what would you like us to do? Let me know in the comments below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.